hey, stick around to the end of the video for a special announcement. But for now, let's get to the video. Druids, druids, druids. The nature wizards, the wilds protectors, the class that can throw any dangerous elements from nature at you, like fire, ice, and bear. Many people claim druids are one of the strongest classes in the game. And it's true that they are very strong. They have spells like entangle, summon beasts, sunbeam, and even detect magic. Isn't that right, Mr. Druid? You are an undead and therefore an abomination, yet when I detect magic upon your person, you give off signs of transmutation, not necromancy. What trickery is this, Lich? Oh my god, I am not a Lich. I'm just a cute little skeleton. You would mistrust a cute little skeleton, would you? <laughs> and that aura of transmutation you sensed gives me the ability to transform this conversation into a segue. Base Druid is great, however, some of its subclasses are not. In fact, I think there are only two good Druid subclasses. So today, we will be buffing five Druid subclasses. So let's talk about Druids. Now, when you think of a Druid, you're probably thinking of some crunchy magical hippie that talks to animals and defends the forests. And you wouldn't be terribly far off with that idea. There's a lot of inspiration you can get for subclasses there. But Wizards of the Coast have clearly already run out of ideas because they made an evil pyromaniac druid and an astronaut that is more like a wizard druid. Let's start with Wildfire Druids, one of the most evil subclasses I have ever seen. Wildfire Druids are based off the idea that forest fires can actually help a forest regrow stronger. But these druids don't really get any options to help regrow plant life that other druids don't get. And actually, any level one druid can use a cantrip to start fires, it wouldn't take much. And a forest is only supposed to have burnings every two to three years, depending on where that forest is. So you're a druid that focuses on something very niche and that you don't do very often, and most other druids can do your job just as well, level one, and those other druids can focus on other aspects of druidry in between burnings. What would you say? You do here. I guess the wildfighter aspect is more about murder. Oh, speaking of murder, they have an ability called Cauterizing Flame. When a creature dies near a wildfire druid, a spectral flame appears over their corpse that can either heal someone or make an explosion. Cool, 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 cool. So that spectral flame is the soul of the recently deceased person, right? I mean, what else could it be? A spectral, meaning ghost-like force, appears above a recently killed creature. Come on, that is someone's soul. It's not like UPS just airdropped a box of band-aids that doubles as TNT on top of a creature right as they die. People think I'm a lich just because I'm a skeleton, but this dude is literally weaponizing souls. Wildfire druids also get a cute little fire elemental friend that can help them on their journey. Oh. Cute little fire elemental friend that they can murder to keep their druidy butts alive. I'm not kidding, that is an actual ability they get. Blazing Revival. It's an ability that kills their fire elemental to give them half their HP. The death of others forwarding your own personal well-being. If that isn't evil, I'm not sure what is. Oh, they can re-summon the fire elemental friend so he doesn't technically die? Well, that doesn't sound like hell at all. Endless sacrificial death for your master. They're basically Mother Teresa with a flamethrower, sucking out all the blood of the poor. What a good Samaritan. This druid is 100% evil, but that's who the subclass is made for. People who want to play a pyromaniac, you don't care about making the forest grow back stronger. You just want to burn all that you can see. Admit it. And despite this subclass being one of the most evil, despicable, most backwards druid subclasses I have ever read, I, uh, I actually, um, I think mechanically speaking, it's actually really well made subclass. I think it's, uh, I think it's really well balanced and it looks like a lot of fun. The only thing I would, uh, add is that I think the wildfire druid and the wildfire spirit should learn the Ignan language because I think that's just very thematic. <clears throat> Star Druid! Easily the most powerful druid subclass and easily the dumbest <laughs> idea for druid I have ever seen. It's a druid that draws its power from starlight, because when I think druid, I think of an inhospitable ball of hot gas in the vacuum of space where absolutely no life can survive. Now that's what being a nature wizard is all about. It's based more on constellations, astrology, and keeping a star chart. That seems more like an oracle than a druid to me, but whatever. I guarantee you this was the chain of thought of how this subclass was made. We need a theme for a druid subclass. Let's see, what's druidy? 
Druids come from Celtic myth, and the British Isles have a lot of Celtic myths about them, but picking one thing from that culture would be so hard. Hard. Like stones. Stonehenge. Stonehenge was allegedly made to mark the positions of the sun over the year, and the sun is in space. What else is in space? Stars! Flight blast! Let's look at the flavor text for this subclass. It says Druids keep records of the stars and their effects on the world to preserve this knowledge from being lost so that others may find it. So they study something, record it on a star map, so to pass that knowledge on to others. And this subclass isn't a wizard because... All right, Stonehenge, duh. I can think of so many more thematically appropriate druids than astrology hippie, like plant druid, ocean druid, weather druid, farming druid, any biome druid. Yeah, I know the circle of land covers most of the biomes, but the circle of land is very bare bones in terms of thematics. I don't think anyone would be too upset if Wizards of the Coast made a more focused Arctic or Underdark Druid subclass. I'll take those over the Druid giving me my star sign any day. Oh, I'm a Libra. All right, I'm done ragging on Star Druid. Let's talk about why it's the strongest hippie at the farmer's market. It gets an ability called Starry Form, which makes your body glow like a constellation. So you turn into a light bright. In light bright form, you have different modes that represent different constellations, and the constellations on your body change to match that. Goblet lets you spread out quick healing. Dragon lets you concentrate better and fly. Archer lets you make a bonus action to attack for 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier. Archer is insanely strong, considering you can chuck a flashlight at a dude, then cast another spell to deal even more damage. It'll last 10 minutes, and you can do this twice per short rest, so effectively you can do this every single fight and you become resistant to bludgeoning piercing and slashing damage because much like the actual constellations it's hard to stab them with a knife all this makes them really strong but there is one ability that really muddles my melons the level 6 ability cosmic omen it gives you two options that are randomly determined at the beginning of the day wheel or woe as a reaction, when a creature within 30 feet of you makes an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can roll a d6 to add to that roll, wheel, or subtract from that roll, woe. Woe is insane! You can subtract from a creature's saving throw, which effectively raises your spell DC and goes against the entire concept of bounded accuracy the principal 5th edition is based on. Star Druid can be constantly polymorphing the boss into a frog to just end fights, and they can do that far more reliably than nearly every other caster in 5e. Other subclasses like Wild Magic Sorcerer can subtract from a creature's saving throw, but Wild Magic Sorcerer only has a D4, not a D6, and to do that, they have to use their sorcery points, which is a very small resource pool. And yeah, the College of Eloquence Bard can do that too, but that subclass is busted anyway, so I'm not counting it. Oh, and Wild Magic Sorcerer, on top of not being able to reliably subtract from saving throws very often, also has to deal with the Wild Magic Table, which is a total crapshoot. It can make you invisible, or it can make you explode. And I'm all for Wild Magic and risk versus reward, but the Wild Magic Sorcerer is getting more risk with less reward, while the Star Druid gets no risk at all reward. It almost makes me wanna... Wanna... Okay, fine. I'm not gonna nerf Star Druid, and if this is the direction 5e is going, I'll accept that. But in return, I get to buff the heck out of Wild Magic Sorcerer when that video comes out. And Star Druid? You got this close to getting nerfed. So Star Druid is our baseline. That's what we should try to buff the other subclasses to, or at least get close to. Let's start with buffing the weakest, Land Druid. The classic, the original, the subclass that focuses on nature and draws power from their homeland. The quintessential nature wizard. And they really are like wizards because at level 2 they straight up get the wizard's best feature but they slapped on a different name. Natural Recovery. Basically you take a short rest and call up Mother Nature asking for your allowance of spell slots and chicken nuggies. And also like the wizard they get more spells, which is great. But you know what just feels wrong? The fact that the de facto caster druid gets less spells than the pyromaniac druid. Who the f do you think you are? Ah! This cannot stand. Wildfire druid gets prepared level one spells and land druid gets none? Get that weakness out of here. 
Here is an updated circle spell list for Land Druid. I picked spells that seemed fitting for each biome. I also made some changes to circle spell lists to make them feel more thematic, or to give some non-Druid spells for the sake of variety. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but here's the list. So level two Land Druid is strong, but after that they get some stinky, hot, non-recyclable, can choke out a sea turtle uh, garbage. Let's skip to their level 14 feature for a moment, Nature's Sanctuary. It lets Mother Nature know that you're a cool guy and that she should not send a swarm of bears to attack you. So plants and beasts have a hard time attacking you or just can't attack you at all. And that's fine, but you get this at level 14. You rarely, if at all, fight plants and beasts at that level. For context, a party of four level 14 characters can easily beat two wyverns at once. There are only 13 beasts and plants as difficult or even more difficult than a wyvern, and many of those are scattered across many different adventure modules, so chances are you won't see most of them. There are beasts and plants of a lower challenge rating you can fight, but none that would provide a notable challenge to high level adventurers. There really just aren't many animals worth fighting at level 14. My point is the ultimate feature of the subclass is one that will rarely ever come up. So you know how we fix this? We give this level 14 feature earlier, and I think we should give it to them at level two. You know, a level where you could still reasonably be scared to fight four big bad wolves. I just think it's a cool ability, and it should be given at a point where it could see use. And if you're worried this is gonna break the game, dude, what kind of game are you running where most of the fights are against plants and animals? What's the name of the module you're running? Balto's Gate, A Descent into Alaska, Platypuses of the Apocalypse, We Fought a Zoo. Assuming you're not running one of those, it's fine. Good campaigns should have some variety with their enemies, so pro tip, don't make the party fight the entire cast of the Lion King. Level 6 gives you Land Stride, which lets you ignore difficult terrain. I assume they do this by equipping cleats or tank treads. The ability to not be impeded by ice rubble and the corpses of the faltering enemy line is good. Pauline is good as manipulating the very fabric of causality! So, we will give them another feature to be on par with Astro Druid. The feature we're adding is called Speed of the Circle. With it, you can cast any of your circle spells as a bonus action. You can cast spells in this way an amount of times equal to your proficiency bonus per long rest. With rules as written, after level two, the biome you picked for this subclass doesn't really matter. Speed of the Circle rewards players for leaning into their chosen biome. Arctic could bonus action hold person and then claw with primal savagery. Underdark could bonus action spider climb and dash up the nearest wall. Forest could activate call lightning and bring down that lightning twice in one turn. <laughs> Moving on to level 14, they get, oh right, we moved that to level two. New feature, Friendly Land Stride. Remember how you could ignore difficult terrain by becoming an M1 Abrams? Now you can give that ability to your friends as a bonus action, and it lasts 10 minutes. The way I envision this is the druid tells nature, hey, this guy, he's cool, he's with me, so don't trip him. All right, if you say so. Thank you, Mr. Rock, you're so nice. Here, let me give you a kiss. Mwah. How's school going? Are you making new friends here? I packed your lunch for the day. I put a bunch of orange slices in for you to have. Okay, bye-bye. It could be that, or, you know. Tank treads. With these changes, I think Land Druid can become the quintessential nature wizard that we all know and want. Moving on, we have Spore Druid. Spore Druid is a subclass that looked at mushrooms and said, yeah, I can weaponize that. They surround themselves in an invisible cloud of spores to kill anyone who says mushrooms don't work on pizza, and then use those same spores to turn the naysayer's body into a zombie puppet. The spores are invisible, and it doesn't say you have to say some magic words or do some crazy Naruto hand signs to have spores attack people. You could just be standing in a crowd of people, breathe, and then have mushrooms start rapidly growing in your lungs, and you would have no idea what's happening, or even who, if anyone, was causing you to experience death by portobello. Truly horrifying. This class was made to be a melee druid, but it sort of fails at that. The Halo Spores feature lets you surround yourself in invisible spores that damage any creature who dares approach you. Ho <laughs> ho! It's baby damage. But considering you can use this an unlimited amount of times, and it's only a reaction to use, it's not bad. The problem is it requires a constitution saving throw. Even when they succeed on the save, you don't deal half damage, you get no damage. You get bumpkiss! Focus, I say! At high levels, this ability will never be useful. To fix it, just make the damage automatic. No saving throw required. The playtest version had this, and it was honestly fine. 
So now that we've made your enemies regret having the audacity to breathe, let's add a little spice to their asthmatic nightmare. At level 2, they get Symbiotic Entity. It makes you deal double damage with Halo of Spores, deal more damage with weapons, and gives you a bunch of temp HP, making you tankier. You spend a use of your Wild Shape to activate this ability, so that's two uses per short rest, baby. I really love this concept of having an alternative way to use core abilities. I'd love to see more mechanics like that in other classes. It gives you an extra D6 to melee damage, which is good, but you get no scaling from it. So it never gets any better as you level up. So it becomes a worse and worse idea to get close to people. You know, the thing a melee build wants to do. Spore Druid has got all these spores. And these spores need a garden to grow in. And I need to carve a garden into your torso because that's as organic as it gets. So to give them a way to keep up in damage, let's have the damage bonus also apply to melee spell attack cantrips, like Primal Savagery. Their inhaler might save them from your spores, but it won't save them from your wolverine claws coated in sulfuric acid. And why does it take an action to activate Symbionic Entity? Should be a bonus action. Moon Druid uses a bonus action to activate their combat wild shape, and it does effectively the same thing. Makes them tankier and deal more damage. Uh, just. You just make this a bonus section. I don't understand. I don't understand how they released this next to Star Druid and we're like, yep, these are both equal. No problem here. And you know what? Let's give Druids another melee cantrip for some variety. Enfeebling Hand. It's a melee spell attack that deals damage and causes the victim to deal less damage on their next attack. So you got Primal Savagery for straight damage, Enfeebling Hand for some damage slash protection, and you got Shillelagh for... They also get Circle Spells but not level one spells. And I just look at Wildfire Druid, and I have to ask, Who the f do you think you are? So we're going to give them Arms of Adar, in case you're in a sticky wicket and need to scamper away and inflict wounds. If you have never used inflict wounds at low levels, let me tell you, it hits like a tactical nuclear bomb. Pair that with Hold Person to reduce your enemies to atoms. Level six, Fungal Infestation. It takes an enemy who dies near you and turns them into your zombie puppet. Man, there is more overlap between druids and liches than I first thought. This is one of the coolest druid features with the worst mechanics I have ever seen. It only works on beasts and humanoids. It only works on small or medium creatures. All your zombie can do is attack, and it uses a zombie stat block, which never improves as you level up. So this needs a massive facelift. One, it can work on small, medium, large, and huge creatures. Two, we increase the amount of creatures this can affect. I'd say it could affect all creatures except constructs, elementals, slimes, or any specific creature the DM decides it would not work on, like a ghost. Side note, I am now going to make a spore ghost as a creature because that sounds terrifying. Three, the zombie can do actions other than attacking. You're telling me I can make a clicker zombie with magic mushrooms to kill my enemies, but telling them to pick up a box is too complicated? Get out of here with that. If I want to make this zombie juggle, that's my Vecna given, right? Will I juggle poorly? Almost certainly. But can you attempt to do it? As Orcus, the Prince of the Undead, as my witness, yes, you can. Four, the way this ability is originally written encourages you to never use your Halo of Spores ability if you wish to raise a zombie. Both require a reaction to use. A free zombie is just so much better and cooler than a potential D6 in damage. So we're going to add this bit of text. If you kill a creature with your Halo of Spores, a melee attack, or a melee spell attack, you can choose to raise that creature as a zombie. No reaction required. This subclass is already using its reaction to deal damage, so let's reward them for playing aggressively and not punish them for it. Crumpin' Mombi, you're now my zombie. Five, the zombie stat block this feature uses is okay, but it has zero scaling, so it gets worse the higher you level up. So I made a new creature with a new stat block, Fungal Zombie. It still has one HP like the original, but Fungal Fortitude lets you make a wisdom saving throw to try and keep it alive any time it takes damage, to keep it at one HP. It's AC, attack, and damage all have scaling, and the bigger the enemy you raise as a zombie, the bigger the damage die of its slam attack. With all of that, I think level six is in a good spot now. <sighs> now onto their level 10, oh God, there's more. Now onto their level 10 feature, spreading spores. Okay, so you know how this subclass is built to be a tanky melee option? What if we took all those ideas and then did none of that? 
This feature lets you take those spores that are always around you, the ones that are used for all your abilities thus far, and then throw them 30 feet away to do garbage damage in a 10 foot cube. And also you can't use your halo of spores to damage people while this ability is active. What are we doing? This feature not only doesn't add to the playstyle of this subclass, but it also turns off your abilities. That's like if LeBron James had the ability to make himself slightly better at badminton, but he couldn't shoot a basketball for an entire season. Okay, easy fix. You may still use your Halo of Spores reaction while using Spreading Spores. But even with that, this is a garbage ability. So brand new additional ability. But first, I have one question for you, and one question only. EXPLOSIONS?! We here at the Bone Wizard channel sincerely believe weaponized corpses are f***ing awesome! It's so awesome, we made a new level feat for Spore Druid. It's called Explosive Death. When one of your fungal zombies, or any undead under your control reaches zero HP, they put on their cool shades and f***ing explode! Any enemy within 10 feet is about to find out if they're a little chump or a soon-to-be pile of goo! Your zombie explodes, dealing damage equal to three rolls of your Halo of Spores. They get a constitution save, so they better hope they ate their broccoli because a balanced diet is a key part of surviving multiple lethal lacerations! Anyone that's weak enough to die to a little bit of explosive biohazard comes back as one of your fungal zombies. Here's a full text of the ability. Now go show the world nothing is more metal than mushrooms, even though there is no metal in fungi that we know of at the time of this recording! Oh, that hurt my throat. <coughs> so yeah, Spore Druids should be better at doing melee now. That was a lot of updates for one subclass. So, I'm gonna call it here for this video. Now that we're at the end, I just want to say a little hey, something. Hey, Wizard, what the heck is this? What about the other subclasses? You barely even talked about Moon Druid! What about Moon Druid? Listen, audience, who I assume all have Brooklyn accents. I'm gonna get to the other druids, but I just I just had to split the druid video into two parts because, I mean, you see how long this is. Anyway, I have an announcement. Bam, Patreon! I am fully committing to the YouTube thing. I am full sending it. So expect to see more videos and expect to see more videos more often. If you like my videos and want to see more of them, consider donating to the Patreon or YouTube membership. If you so kindly choose to support me, you get access to perks that I think are actually cool and worth it. Like private Discord access, shoutouts at the end of my videos, four magic items a month to add to your D&D games, play testing the material I present in my videos, bloopers because I mess up my lines a lot, reviewing your D&D 5th edition homebrew to see if it's good and balanced. So check out the Patreon or YouTube membership. They're both the same. And even if you don't become a patron, that's cool. We got a Discord for everyone to hang out in. I'm also on Twitter where I post nonsense devoid of any context. And I stream on Twitch every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. I genuinely love making these videos and the fact that you've watched up to this point, it means a lot to me. I receive so much positive feedback from you guys and it's a little overwhelming, but it, it, it's good. It's good. So even if you don't decide to become a patron, even just liking, subscribing, or commenting helps. And even if you don't do that, I still appreciate that you took the time out of your busy day to watch a stupid skeleton talk about a silly dice game. So, thanks. Man, I really hope this isn't too sappy. It was. Hi, it's me, Post Bone Wizard here. I have 20 seconds to talk about things that are on my mind. Uh. That, that OGL thing, really happy it passed in our favor. Just kind of touch and go there. But hey, we won, so let's celebrate. That's awesome. It's celebration. I'm going to list my social security number. One, two.